Hi, welcome to a special Crisis Group podcast. I'm Alan Boswell, a senior analyst in our Horn of Africa team. Shortly, I'll be asking Azade Moaveni, a senior gender analyst for Crisis Group, about a report we just published on the role of women in Somalia's Al-Shabaab movement. Al-Shabaab is a diminished yet still potent Islamist insurgency that still controls much of rural Somalia. For years, the outside world has invested significant resources on trying to beat back Al-Shabaab militarily, primarily through the large deployment of African Union forces, who have fought a deadly ground war clawing back territory from the group bit by bit. Crisis Group has long argued, though, that a more nuanced approach is sorely needed, because Al-Shabaab is both a militant group and a political movement. Al-Shabaab's staying power stems not just from the Somali state's weakness, but also from Al-Shabaab's own ability to continue generating revenue, as well as navigating the clan politics inside Somalia. Al-Shabaab also provides order and services in the areas under its control. What also goes underlooked is the role that women play in Al-Shabaab. Azadeh is one of the authors of a new crisis group report that looks at just that. Azadeh was also one of the authors of a recent crisis group report looking at the challenges facing women who leave Boko Haram in Nigeria, as well as the author of an upcoming book on women inside ISIS. Hi, Azadeh. Hi, Alan. Thanks for joining me for this discussion. Um, actually, we have never met uh, because Crisis Group has so many offices around the world. Good to be connected from afar. <laughs> it's great to talk again. Uh, first off, uh, why is it important to study the role of women in jihadi movements? I think women are a key social base of, of lots of jihadist insurgencies, and we tend to only notice that at particularly striking moments. Um, if there's first with ISIS, for example, we saw this big exodus of women from Western European countries, from from the Mediterranean, from from the Middle East, and suddenly there was you know a massive movement of women to to underpin and support the Islamic State. Or we notice women underpinning insurgencies when Boko Haram dispatches women suicide bombers. So it's kind of at these flashpoint or almost iconic moments or iconic moments of movement that we notice it. But if we take a step back, I think they're socially as a base key to too many uh, of these of these insurgencies. And understanding that, I think it's key to understanding why the insurgency has arisen in the first place, why they're so adaptive, why they can be so flexible. Women are often really key to that. A lot of times uh, these different insurgencies um, target women or the way that they the way that they deploy women has a lot to do with how the state in question that they're opposing has treated women of their community or of their movement. So kind of understanding that helps close the circle, I think, of, of how um, a lot of these uh, movements came about in the first place. Um, and then I guess finally, to have groups tend to have quite impressive gender strategies, very often better than the states that they oppose. And it's states and, and militaries and, and counter-terror forces that are doing the catch-up to understand why they're so able to recruit, why they're so good at engaging the women um, in that they're, they're trying to target. Um, often that's coercive, of course, but it's often very effective. So I think if we're going to understand the roots of these conflicts, we have to see how they interact with women and how women underpin them. That's a, a fascinating indictment of most counterinsurgency strategies around the world. Now, normally, women are discussed as either victims of conflict. Um, sometimes we also discuss them as potential peacemakers. That tends to be the more dominant discourse when it comes to discussing women in conflict. But what does this miss? Looking at women either as victims or peacemakers leaves out why women might be moved to be radical or militant in the first place as political actors. Um, they, they must be getting something out of affiliating with these insurgencies. I mean, taking apart and always caveated with with the reality that a lot of women are kidnapped and coerced and forced. That's a reality, whether it's Nigeria that we're talking about or Somalia and Al-Shabaab. Um, but looking at women who join voluntarily, I think is key because there is a degree of agency. And if women are getting something out of joining an insurgency, we have to understand what that is, right? So if uh, when we were working on Nigeria and, and why women would be drawn to Boko Haram or so persuasive to go back to it. And in situations where they had got out, a lot of them reported that they really valued the education that the group offered them. For many, it was the first time that they were receiving any formal education. Um, so 
to kind of reduce women to either victim of of these barbaric insurgents or the, the you know the the, the force that shows up the at the end and brings them together misses out I think on a key aspect of women um, as a kind of cornerstone of a community or citizenship that wants more I mean that wants social empowerment that wants education you know citizens who want protection and some degree of stability um, predictable security so women as citizens I think is is something that has to be a premise as as, as we try and understand um, women as a social base of insurgencies. And I think victims and peacemakers kind of leaves out the category of women as citizen with political, social expectations and aspirations, too. And you've uh, written about this quite lucidly in the context of ISIS, too, uh, by describing the term jihadi brides as something quite patronizing for the reasons you just outlined. Um, so I'd encourage everyone to go look at that piece as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I live in the UK, and I think the UK tabloids coined the term jihadi bride um, and and really got a lot of traction out of it as a kind of way of understanding something I think that uh, a lot of people is unfathomable. Why would young women from the West, from, you know, who are very often, you know, doing very well in school, A students, why would they go to join ISIS while they are, they're brainwashed or they're lured or, um, you you know what what is drawing them it's adventure and romance and and you know very often it's portrayed as sexual adventure um, but i think that strips out all the political context to why women would would think about such a pathway and a lo- and you know often part of that context is grievances against uh different western military policies in the region uh grievances against uh support for for dictators uh middle eastern dictators so i think the political context gets left out when we're suddenly thinking about brides and veils and, and, and honeymoons in the desert. Now, I'd say that a, a lot of these uh, issues with simplistic narratives is also something that, that we find in the Horn of Africa also at a more senior level when it comes to the leadership um, of some of these armed movements in the region and not just jihadi ones, whereas the peacemaker narrative, uh, some organizations make it so simple as to basically state that you know, women, that men strike power sharing deals and women strike deals that uh, benefit everyone, whereas you, you find it's much more complicated. Oftentimes, women can be the uh, hardliners in an armed group of movement. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very much, you know, this is a, this is a theme we keep coming back to uh, when it comes to analyzing women in conflict and doing so in a way that is not just patronizing and simplistic at its core. Absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, there's a lot of work that just focuses on women as um, kind of militant cheerleaders, you know, kind of singing songs to rouse the men and, and egg them on. Um, but even that language and framing kind of suggests that they're always auxiliary rather than, you know, very often thinking that their clan will benefit by pushing this aspect of a conflict or they will stand to benefit. You know, they are actors, even if even if their role is not directly military or operational. Now, Specifically in Somalia, with the report we have coming out um, that has just been published, uh, what did we find in our interviews with uh, both men and women in Somalia about the role of uh, women in al-Shabaab? It was really fascinating, um, partly because there's so little written and so little worked on in women and al-Shabaab. Uh, so it was it was quite an opportunity to be able to get some access to women who had been married to Shabaab fighters, who had played different roles in in the movement themselves um, we found that there was uh, that there was a real spectrum of, of involvement um, some women kind of married into al-shabaab they were pressured by family or relatives um, to, to marry a shabaab member and kind of became al-shabaab um, through that uh, but had never really internalized it for themselves and and ended up getting out and when they got divorced, you know, that kind of ended um, their their association with the group, whereas others were quite committed. Um, they, they might have joined through ties of kinship, and I think, you know, marriage is, is a key way that uh, relationships between clans and the movement are, are brokered and upheld, um, but were still really quite actively supportive. And then within that, again, um, a, a, a real myriad variety of roles. Um, women involved in, in recruitment and proselytizing. Uh, we spoke to women who were involved in, in um, you know, these indoctrination centers or depending on how you view it, you know, madrasas where Shabab ideology and ethos is taught and upheld. Um, 
you know, operationally, Shabbat relies on women in a really striking way. I mean, I was very surprised to see the extent of its reliance, especially compared to other jihadist groups. I mean, women uh, do fundraising, propel funds into Shabbat through the taxation of their small businesses, or, you know, again, depending on how you were to view it, it could be quite, you could view that as extortion. Uh, they ferry explosives in small parts that are essential to military operations that, that Shabab um, that Shabab does. Uh, intelligence gathering, um, and a lot of this, especially in intelligence gathering, relies on precisely what you were saying before, the assumption that women are not really active members are not operationally to be worried about. So it's kind of um, a blind spot of the of the federal government and, and Amazon forces who, who are there on the ground that women can kind of sneak past or not taken seriously as a security threat. So they can manage to get these explosives through checkpoints. They can gather this intelligence that then, you know, helps planning of attacks. Um, so a really quite impressively wide variety of, of roles that, that women take on um, within the operational world of al-Shabaab and not simply, um, you know, the, the carrying on, of course, of the next generation of fighters, the cultivating of of the ideology um, amongst children. I mean, I mean, that we see, I think, in, in almost all jihadist groups, but really active across um, the realm of, of um, fundraising, intelligence and tactical operations of the group. Now, you said that you were surprised by how deep this uh, these roles for women are in al-Shabaab compared to the other jihadi groups you've looked at. Out of those different roles, which are the ones that you found most surprising? I would say um, the intelligence gathering. Um, intelligence gathering and um, and and ferrying of, of explosive parts or other small arms that are needed. I mean, those are quite delicate and important roles. And intelligence gathering is really crucial. I mean, if you're using this intelligence to then orchestrate a fairly complex military uh, attack, you know, getting what you need, instructing a woman with what she needs to, to come back with. Um, this, for example, is something that we have not heard at all with, with Boko Haram. Um, and perhaps it reflects different and varying societal attitudes towards women and their roles in northeastern Nigeria versus Somalia. Um, but the degree to which uh, al-Shabaab seemed to engage women, rely on them, and, you know, perhaps it's, um, you know, it was an adaptive thing. I mean, al-Shabaab has faced, you know, increasing um, pressure from the Amazon forces and, and the federal government um, in recent years, I think, especially since 2014. Um, so perhaps it's been adaptive and, and it's you know, pragmatic on the side of al-Shabaab. Um, but through that, you know, it, it relies on women and engages them. And I think this really goes to speak to the fact why it's important to analyze each one of these Islamist insurgencies in the embedded context where they fight, and not just as a broad programs that you that you see coming out of the international response uh, to these uh, jihadi groups. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Shabab operates in a very orthodox and very Somali way when when it comes to the question of women. Um, in a lot of ways, its approach, uh, you know, whatever you might think of its transnational or Salafi, you know, values or ethos, gets matched or overridden by Somali values, um, and is ultimately, you know, a Somali phenomenon. Um, in ways that you could, you know, describe the same dynamic for, for Boko Haram. Um, so while I think the the dynamic of women being key is something that thematically we can pull out, and I think that's what Crisis Group is, is trying to do uh, by looking at female militancy uh, more closely, uh, but, but within that, it's absolutely, I think, crucial to to look at the particular context rather than imagine this as some you know transnational jihadi blob that that has a kind of human resource book for women now, now of course we we should not uh, downplay the restrictive life of a woman living under al-shabaab right life can be quite harsh for women in areas controlled by al-shabaab in somalia absolutely um and and the things that women kind of report that al-shabaab offers them very often um you know, women will invoke its court system and the ability to go to a Al Shabab court to to deal with family law, Islamic family law around divorce or inheritance. You know, this is very much through the absence of state institutions. Um, it's it's a it's a reliance on Shabab institutions that comes from an absence of of other ones. Um, that might be that would you know hopefully for women be more just. Um, you know, it's it's often said uh, women told us that 
they rely or appreciate the degree of protection from sexual violence that they get in Shabab controlled areas. But again, you know, that's highly uh, contingent on a couple of things. I mean, you know, Shabab imposes very strict uh, regulations on on women's ability to be in public space. They have to be with uh, a, a male relative at all times. Even if a woman uh, is, is raped in al-Shabaab territory, but she's been out without her, her male appointed guardian, you know, from what we've understood, you know, she can't take that case to a Shabab court. So it's within a really strict um, kind of regime of highly orthodox and for women, highly disempowering regulations in public life that it offers these things that it offers. So given all that, why do you think it is some women choose uh, to be to take an active part in al-Shabaab? So essentially, women and, and men as well um, are, are dealing with the only power in town. Um, so choice is very often a matter of mitigating what would happen to you, the physical costs, the financial costs, the repercussions of not cooperating. Um, that said, I think highlighting the things that it does offer uh, to, to women, these justice mechanisms, is really important because we, we've learned, for example, through our research and talking to former al-Shabaab wives that divorce is incredibly common. Uh, in the movement. Um, there's a lot of hardship. Men are constantly deployed. All of the women we spoke to uh, had been divorced, were very disappointed by their marriages. There's, you know, quite prevalent po- polygamy um, with men absent, not able to support multiple families, you know, huge uh, dissatisfaction by women. Um, so being able to go to a court, petition for a divorce, get some um, financial support or, or whatever um, whatever is, is the due of women is, is a very important thing. Um, I don't think, though, that we can then conflate that with women... Um, you know, broadly subscribing to the the whole project of Al Shabab and its treatment of women, which can be quite punitive um, in terms of uh, the severity of the dress code, punishments for women who don't uphold it, women who don't follow these these regulations. Um, this is this is um, a reality. Yeah, this this fact of how many women petition uh, successfully to get divorced within the Al Shabab movement really jumped out at me uh, in reading the report. And, and again, really speaks to why it's so important to take a more nuanced approach to this group, um, because it's not just a, a militant group, it's also a political movement. And Crisis Group has been arguing for some time, you know, that the military response that has been favored, uh, you know, is, is, is lacking often in, in a more nuanced um, approach to it. I completely agree. I think the, di- the divorce prevalence and the theme of divorce highlights just how Somali uh, Shabab is because Somali society seems to be quite accepting of divorce. It seems quite widespread throughout. Um, but at the same time, Shabab offers a justice mechanism for women who are trying to navigate their way financially out of out of a divorce or out of the death of, of, of a father. Um, so it's operating in a sphere of acute government weakness at the same time, um, you know, helping women do something that is socially really quite common in in their lives. Now, part of what's interesting about all that we found with the role of women in Somalia is that neither the government nor Al-Shabaab are obviously keen to advertise this because, you know, most people don't know uh, that they are this active and play such important roles in intelligence and fundraising and recruitment like we found. Now, why is it that we never hear about this and that both sides of this conflict are not very eager to to advertise it. The, the view of women, um, you know, with, by Shabab officials, and, and we spoke to male fighters, defectors um, as, as well to kind of explore and, and confirm some of the things we heard from women. Um, women are not really included in the decision-making apparatuses. They're not included in the high-level um, kind of uh, decision-making centers in Shabab. They're not really viewed as full-fledged members by Shabab itself, the men. Um, women who are committed, engaged, active, you know, if you were to ask them, are you with Shabab? I, th- I think they would say yes. Um, so I think partly we're dealing with 
you know, a very patriarchal culture, uh, both on the side of al-Shabaab and the government, the federal government that it, that it opposes. Um, so women uh, are, are both a blind spot, but I think also um, kind of conventional, stereotypical attitudes causes men, uh, whether in the movement or in, in the federal government, to minimize and perhaps not acknowledge the extent of the role that women play. I think it's worth also mentioning, though, that this aspects of the of the stereotyped role can sometimes work to women's benefit. So we haven't talked yet about women defectors and how hard it is to integrate into, um, you know, mainstream or non-Shabab area society for women who get out of the group. And, and there is really acute stigma, um, certainly the case with women in, in Nigeria as well. The, and in that case, there's, you know, we're talking a whole different volume, tens of thousands of women who've come out of Boko Haram facing intense stigma. And, and I think as, as reintegration, um, as part of their reintegration experience, the idea that they're just women does play to their advantage. I think communities might be more inclined to tolerate them, accept them, because they think that, oh, they were just women. They managed to escape. wasn't her fault. Um, you know, the, the kind of ascribed or assumed lack of agency on the other end of coming out of a jihadist group, I think can help women cope with stigmas. Now, in Nigeria, you found that these blinders that poly- policymakers have, both from the Nigerian government and from international uh, coalitions that are supporting the Nigerians' campaign against Boko Haram, that these blinders um, towards the role of women uh, can really leave some blind spots in, in our approach to defeating these groups. Um, can you talk about that? Absolutely. Um, I think the the blind spots can also operate in terms of understanding what motivates women, right? So one thing that we hear over and over again, and I think I mentioned this before, is that women appreciated the education that Boko Haram offered. Um, a lot of them, a lot of the women that we spoke to said they came out because they wanted their children to have access to primary education. And, you know, Boko Haram, even the name, you know, it embodies the idea of opposition to secular or government education. Um, but this has been um, such a, a key aim for women and aspiration. Uh, and that's something that the the government in northeastern Nigeria, the, the, the federal government of Nigeria, um, if it had the political will and the determination, could offer to, to the states of the northeast who are facing this insurgency. So if you see clearly that this is a key draw, that women say, we want to be educated, we want to feel worthy, we don't really feel like we count as, as citizens because we're not even offered you know, basic literacy, but but those guys in the bush who launch these heinous attacks and do these other abhorrent things, they think we're worthy of educating. I think that's a pretty compelling thing to to be able to understand. It's a question for the Nigerian government and President Buhari. You know, why, if you're hearing over and over again that women um, are are seeking a pathway to education, oftentimes and willing to sustain a lot of violence against themselves to get that, you know, why not provide it for them? It's not a big mystery. Now, moving over to Somalia, then, if you're a policymaker and your interest is in strengthening the Somali government and weakening al-Shabaab, what would you advise as the main takeaways from our findings? Two things stand out to me. Uh, one is that the federal government really needs a strategy against gender-based violence, um, whether that is... Is, is passing uh, a law that, um, a sexual offenses law that, amongst other things, um, really penalizes sexual assaults, that raises the age of marriage to 18, um, that deals with lots of aspects of women and girls' safety. Um, it, it could take that forward. Um, and it's not simply symbolic. I think it shows that the government takes women's safety and the suffering that they've endured through all of these years of, of war and clan warfare, that it takes that seriously. Um, I think that is, is key. And then um, secondly, and, and this is far off, and I think we know that it's far off, but working on some dispute mechanisms or eventually a court system that can deliver those same things that Shabab offers, you know, family law courts that can work to women's benefit. Um, I think those are are, are two main uh, areas that that we think 
are, are worth focusing on. There's a couple of other things, though. Um, I think there's not a huge number of women who leave the movement, but those who do could could use more support integrating. There's the stigma that we talked about. And then I think finally having more women um, in, in security forces so that there are women at checkpoints um, and protection for women in security forces at the same time. So if there's going to be a sharper eye on, on women's um, tactical or operational involvement in the group, it's done in a way that doesn't potentially um, encourage or, or create a theater for abuse. So um, we're really aware that the policy conclusions from from the work that we've done are, 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 are just nascent, really, in developing. But I think as themes, these are really key. A strategy against gender-based violence, um, more women in security forces, and some courts or a court system, however far off it is, to make an effort towards beginning to build one um, that women can, can have recourse to. And of course, we're just getting started. Uh, we have this report that just came out recently on Boko Haram and women trying to and struggling to integrate back into society when they leave Boko Haram and now this one on women in Al-Shabaab. So thanks, Azadeh. Thank you. I uh, enjoyed talking with you and hopefully um, we can do it again. Um, I'm just back from Syria visiting a camp that held 12,000 ISIS women. Um, so maybe we can come back together and discuss that too. Sounds good. I hope so. And I hope to meet you soon in person as well. Yes. Yes. Our paths must cross. Thanks for listening. Once again, this was a Crisis Group special podcast. We hope to bring you more of these soon. Until then, you can find this and all the rest of our reports on our website, crisisgroup.org. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Crisis Group. And we do have a new special Instagram account, which you all should follow also. Also.